While comic books cross over often enough that fans have coined the term event fatigue to refer to them, comic companies do it far less often. That's not to say that it has never happened, though. There are a number of crossovers between Marvel and DC, Wildstorm, and Image throughout the mid to late 90s. In fact, my research on this particular book reveals a fan theory of a whole alternate reality just for those cross-company crossovers. Plus, episode 1.12 of this very podcast talked at length about the World War III crossover between Marvel Comics and Wildstorm Comics, which either ended the Heroes Reborn universe or was just a fun adventure that no one wants to remember anymore. These events have become very rare in the modern day, and that's because there are a number of problems with a company-based crossover. Which company hires and pays for the creative team? Which company pays for the publication costs? How do you ensure that the characters from each company have time to shine? How do you split the money made on the sale of this comic, and do the two companies honor that deal in perpetuity? What about trade paperback sales? What about digital sales nowadays? Plus, Marvel and DC are both owned by larger corporate entities that are very conscious of their brand. These kind of complications may seem too focused on money and the back matter of making comics, but these are the kind of questions that keep me up at night. Plus, comics, as much as they are an art form, are also a product that is meant to sell and make money. If a company doesn't think that it's worthwhile to invest time, energy, and money into a project that they're only ever going to keep some of the money from, then why would they do it? Well, because it's fun. Look, I will never be able to tell you that every crossover comic book is great, or that it is a masterpiece, but they sure as sh no swearing can be fun. Seeing Batman and Spider-Man team up to stop Carnage? That's awesome. Watching the chaotic teens of Gen 13 meet with the angsty weirdos of Generation X was great. When Marvel and DC teamed up for the Versus event in 1996, which then birthed Amalgam Comics in 1996 and 7? Why, that blew my 12-year-old mind. But the real trick to telling a cross-company story, in my opinion is picking the right creative team for the right characters and telling the right story. And today's book does all of that in spades. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 10.11, Maverick, Team X slash Team 7. If you've been following the streak of episodes about Maverick, like you should have been, then you know that Maverick was once known as David North and worked for the CIA as part of Team X. Team X was a group of three men, all of them subtly superpowered, who were sent into missions far too dangerous for normal humans. Among them was Victor Creed and the man called Logan, who would eventually go on to become Sabretooth and Wolverine, respectively. The three men didn't always get along, Creed's hunger for death and violence put them all in danger far too many times, but they were an effective unit, dang gummit. That can't be denied. The thing that I think is interesting here is the basic concept of both teams. Team X was conceived as the covert ops history of established Marvel characters like Wolverine and Sabretooth, with Maverick added in as the new guy and Team 7 was conceived as the covert ops history of various Wildstorm characters from all of their titles, books like Wildcats, Gen 13, Wetworks, and Deathblow. The very basic concept here is the same, and while executed wildly differently, I love that. Author Warren Ellis said in a recent interview about the latest relaunch of Wildstorm's properties that he looked back at the themes and ideas present in those early books, and he just modernized them. Ideas like biological weapons, government conspiracies, advanced technology, and an alien influence on humanity. And given that author-slash-artist Jim Lee was largely responsible for the creation of Team X, I can't help but wonder how much of an influence he had on the creation of Team 7. Was this team conceptualized during the creation of Wildstorm's books, 
solidifying the shared continuity of the Wildstorm universe? Or was it something that they came up with after the launch, like what happened with Team X? I will very likely never know, but the ideas here are too similar for me to ever discount a possible inspirational connection. For those who aren't familiar with it, Team 7 is a military black ops unit that works for International Operations, or I.O. The director of I.O., Miles Craven, wanted to create superhuman agents, so he dropped a chemical called the Gen Factor on Team 7. This enabled him to blame their enemies during the potential suicide mission. But, unfortunately, the members survived. And they did eventually develop superpowers. Some of them left the unit, others went mad and committed suicide. Many of them went on to have kids, which would eventually start up Wildstorm's Gen 13 and DV8 titles. Team 7 consists of five members who I'll just give a quick rundown of now. John Lynch is the team's leader in the field. He has medium-length brown hair and a red circle with a line coming up the top over his left eye. All members of Team 7 wear some form of facial paint, I guess? I'm not sure why they do, other than that facial markings in the 90s were hot, but yeah, they all have it. Michael Cray is the big muscular dude of the group, like, think Arnold from Predator Big. Cray typically wears a bandana over his scalp, and he has two red lines running from that scalp down to his jawline. We've actually met Cray before, in episode 1.12. This is the guy that Ben Grimm met when he was floating in the negative zone. Jackson Dane is another brunette, although he wears, uh... <laughs> okay, I don't know what to call this. It's one of those hats where only one side is bent upwards, but, you know, like, onto, onto the side... Like, in my head, it's called the Australian hat, but I'm sure that Australians wear more hats than just this thing. But he's got a hat on throughout the whole book, and he has a stylized lightning bolt over his left eye. Cole Cash has blonde hair, and uh, some kind of pointy thing on his left eye? Like, it's, it's a little weird to describe. It looks like something that a member of KISS might have on. He's also the youngest member of the group. Finally, we have Philip Chang. Chang has medium-length black hair, a goatee, and is the team's communications and tech expert. He has a red crescent shape next to his right eye. I'm pretty sure that we're all familiar with Team X at this point, but just in case, here's a rundown of those guys. The man called Simply Logan is a living mystery. A product of the government-operated Weapon X project, Logan has no memory of his past. He does have a healing factor, allowing him to heal from wounds that would kill another man. Logan also has enhanced senses, although his ability to smell is typically the only one that really gets focused on. He is relatively short, with dark hair swept back from his face. He will eventually join the X-Men and remain a stalwart member for years to come. Victor Creed is everything that Logan is, but worse. He's bigger, he's meaner, and he's got an attitude to match. Armed with razor-sharp claws, Creed's need to kill makes him both the perfect weapon and a potentially dangerous loose cannon. Creed is tall, he's well-built, and blonde, with high cheekbones, pointed incisors, and thick sideburns. Creed goes on to become Sabretooth, a rogue psychopath who does as he pleases, which is mostly kill people. David North is of average size and height, and his face is obscured by a mask, save for his jaw. All three men wear black bodysuits with yellow accents and armor. All of them wear helmets, too, although North is generally the only one to keep his on for any length of time. North will become Maverick, a mercenary, and we've covered him in some pretty good amount of depth lately. Whew! Enough with the setup, Ben. We've met the cast, we know the deal, let's do this. Load up your guns, strap in tight, and kiss your loved ones goodbye. We're going in. Our story opens in Numidia, where we join a small military convoy as it passes through the foothills of some mountains. 
Colonel Assad of Numidia is escorting a blonde woman wearing sunglasses named Lenny Zauber along the northern border. He questions her suggestion that they increase the defenses there, as attacking from the north is almost as dangerous as attacking to the south. Zauber says that she's here as a goodwill gesture from East Germany, meant to help the development of their super soldier program. If Assad has no intention of listening to her, then why would he even agree to this? For those who may not know, East Germany was allied with the Soviet bloc during the Cold War. Astute listeners might guess which Russian super soldier will be appearing soon in this book, which does not include me, because I was totally unaware of anything regarding the Cold War going into this. Look at that. My love of comics leading me to learn about history. Who says that comics are stupid? Anyway, an American attack helicopter suddenly streaks across the path of the convoy. Assad applauds Zauber's instincts. Clearly, she knew what she was talking about. But Zauber, who is really the shape-shifting mutant named Mystique, feels her blood run cold. She didn't expect there to actually be anything in the North. The whole reason that she is here is to draw forces away from the South, so that her team can infiltrate. So who the hell is in that helicopter? Okay, really quickly, I did not expect Mystique to show up in this book. It totally fits her character and her background, but to the best of my knowledge, Mystique never had anything to do with Team X. To be fair, she is here as a government operative who happens to be clearing the way for them, so it's not like she's a long-hidden member of the team, it's more like she's an ally. Still, this was pretty surprising to me. Assad's forces open fire on that chopper, and we move inside with the bullets. Team 7 had been told that this insertion route was secure, so what the hell happened? Did their inside operative lie to them, or what? None of the team has time to worry about it, as the stray fire from Assad's forces kills their two pilots. John Lynch dives forward and grabs the stick until Cole Cash can slide up front and take control of the craft. Their flight path takes them directly into the radar cone of a SAM, or surface-to-air missile. An attack radar warning goes off in the helicopter, and they juke the bird. The craft dodges the first salvo of missiles, but Jackson Dane takes a look at who's firing on them. He recognizes the SAMs and tells their makeshift pilot to escape the radar cone. Cash knows that they can't jam the radar without chaff and jammers, so they're going to have to destroy them. There's no way that they can flee this fast enough, so he turns the helicopter around and flies right back at them. They only have two weapons, he states. This helicopter and their cojones. He flies the helicopter into the radar truck and Team 7 bails on the burning craft. <laughs> Look, if you don't like your men to be macho to the max then get off of the ride now, folks. This is only the beginning of this book, and that line about balls was in the actual comic. I didn't make that up. This is an action-packed, tough guy extravaganza in two dimensions, and there is no turning back. Team 7 flees from the impact, running and gunning. They clear the area and are all, somehow, alive and unhurt. They are also without transport, not at their target yet, and have alerted Numidia pretty handily that they're here. Lynch has them commandeer one of the SAM launchers, saying that it might be slow, but at least it will get them there. They even get a leftover missile in the deal, if Chang can bypass its required-to-fire radar lock. He's confident that this will be easy. He's already finished booby-trapping the rest of the surviving vehicles. We bounce to Team X next, but let's hang on for a second. This introduction is fast, it is packed with action, and it gets us invested pretty quickly. We're told that Team 7 is here to retrieve any files that they can in regard to Numidia's super soldier program, and then to destroy whatever they can't take. Author Larry Hama introduces all of the team through their dialogue, although I won't lie, that dialogue is pretty interchangeable. It's all just stereotypical tough guy talk, and it reflects little in the way of individual personalities. This opening really made me think of the Expendables movies. 
these men can't die not because they're skilled or have superpowers, but because they're just too manly to die. I mean, how else can you explain them surviving machine gun fire, a crashing helicopter, and the resulting explosion from said crash? We're also told during this scene that Team 7 has a woman on the inside, but we know that that isn't Zauber. She had no clue that Team 7 was infiltrating at all. In fact, her team is Team X, and we catch up with them inserting from the south. Creed gives his teammates a hard time as they move through the desert in the darkness. Come on, boys, they've only been running for 50 miles. They can't be getting tired now, right? Logan and North both respond pretty dryly, but stop as a series of explosions rock the horizon to the north. Creed notes that that is in the direction of their target, and Logan recognizes the signature of C4 and detonation cord. If explosions are happening and they aren't even there, then something must have happened with their inside operative. Creed tries to run off, but Logan grabs him by the ankle instead, forcing the big man to eat sand. He turns around, angry, and Logan draws a knife, which he then uses to carefully uncover a landmine in the sand. Creed stands up, complaining that their insider should have warned them about mines. They're just lucky that Logan could smell the rubber in them. North replies that while the inside op didn't say anything about the mines, they did provide a schematic of the facility. He notes an access tunnel just to their north, which should get them in. Logan carefully leads the way through the mines, his fellows being careful to follow in his footsteps. As with the Team 7 scene, Hama introduces us to the members of Team X here. I will fully admit that I am much more familiar with these guys, so I can pick up on their personalities a lot better. Creed is the rude, brash hothead. Logan is careful and calm. North is prepared, loaded up with guns, gadgets, and the map. We can immediately pick up on how annoying Creed is and the general dislike that the other two have for him. However, Logan is a good dude, and so he doesn't let his teammate get blown up just because he's a jerk. I'm mildly annoyed that Creed doesn't smell the landmines. He also has enhanced senses. I can see him being too eager to get into a fight, and so he totally overlooks the mines, but this does kind of feel like more of an oversight to me. The three of them make it to the tunnel, and they find two guards casually chatting outside of it. Logan calls dibs on the men and kills them quickly, stabbing one in the heart and breaking the neck of the other with one arm. This impresses Creed, who asks Logan if he's going to take their ears as trophies. Logan replies in the negative, but he also tells Creed not to take them. The blonde man shrugs and heads for the tunnel. It's all right, he'll just find some trophies of his own. Before he can, though, North grabs him by the back of his collar. His scanners are picking up metal detectors and thermal scanners in that tunnel. The second that they go in, their presence here will be known. Creed says that their enemies want to know if something human and carrying weapons enters that tunnel, and he can get around those qualifications. Then he takes off his pants. Have you... have you been waiting for this moment, Creed? Because it kind of feels like you have been. Anyways... Taking off his clothes and guns will keep the metal detectors from going off. Creed then sprays himself down with a fire extinguisher, which will lower his body temperature long enough to foil the scanners. He'll run down the tunnel, kill the guards on the other end, shut off the alarms, and then the boys can join him. Logan and North have little choice as Creed takes off into the tunnel without them. Deeper inside the facility, we find my favorite Soviet-era bad guy, Omega Red, with a woman named Muriel Duplessis. Duplessis is a fit-looking woman in thigh-high boots, bicep-high gloves, and a bodice made of leather. A spiked collar circles her neck, and short spikes run up her arms. Her black hair is pulled back in a ponytail, making her sharp features seem even more intimidating. She walks into the scene with a purpose and pride, immediately making me think that she either has enhanced strength or a really good amount of self-confidence. 
Duplessis is complaining to Omega Red about Zalbert diverting their forces to the north, when the south is where the real danger lies. Omega Red, being really honest here, tells her that he doesn't trust either woman. His homeland needs the oil concessions that Numidia can provide in exchange for access to Russia's information on how to make super soldiers. That doesn't mean that Omega Red has to like it, or trust her, or Zauber. But, since Assad did go to the north, then he will personally inspect this access tunnel to the south that she so fears. Omega Red's patriotism doesn't impress Duplessis, though. She's read his files. She knows what he was before he became Omega Red. A sudden alarm cuts any further discussion off, informing the facility that there has been an attack to the north. Omega Red's tendrils shoot out and grab Duplessis by the neck, forcing her down to her knees. He is outraged. She wanted them to focus on the south, yes? Well, why is that if the north is where the real danger lies? Duplessis, to her credit, insists while choking that the south is the real threat. If you couldn't guess, Duplessis is Team 7's inside agent, meant to draw attention from the North in the same way that Zauber was meant to do for the South. She's just partnered up with a much more volatile man, unfortunately for her. We then move back to Creed, who succeeds in his goal. Logan and North come running once the scanners are shut off, North commenting on the screams of the guards. Sounds like the team Psycho is back at it again. And sure enough, on his end of things, Creed is trying to figure out how to remove the guard's ears without his knife. Before he can actually do that, though, Omega Red and Duplessis, now armed with a rifle, arrive. Creed knew that he should have shoved a grenade down Red's throat when they were in Berlin. But that's okay, he'll just do the job now. Creed roars and leaps at Omega Red, and just a reminder, he is still naked here, and Omega Red catches him in midair with his tendrils. Omega Red unleashes his death spores through those tendrils, draining away Creed's life. Duplessis steps up and fires a couple of rounds into the helpless Creed, trying to kill him. Logan and North arrive just in time to open fire, driving Omega Red and Duplessis back. The pair decides that they need to inform the security forces of this incursion, so they leave Team X for this time and retreat. Logan moves to Creed's fallen body, because he isn't getting up. North suggests leaving him, he's too wounded to go on. But Logan refuses. They are a team, and they won't leave him behind. Logan hefts Creed onto his shoulders, and they keep moving. A few little things. I love that Creed refers to Team X's last encounter with Omega Red in Berlin, we saw some of that mission play out at the beginning of the Maverick one-shot, and it was one of the final missions that the team ran together. This heightens the conflict with Omega Red in general, and adds a motivating factor to his interactions with Team X. These men made a fool of him once before. He knows that they're tenacious, that they're hard to kill, and he wants them dead. So setting this after Berlin makes this mission more than that. It isn't just a job... Now it's become personal. However, once Creed is injured, this basically turns into a repeat of the Team X scene from Wolverine issue 87. Creed is wounded to the point of near death, Maverick suggests that he's a liability and that they need to leave him, and Logan argues otherwise. And I do not like that. There aren't a lot of Team X stories out there, and now this one is playing a scene that we have seen before. That is lame. I wanted something new here. When I first read this comic, I honestly thought that Hama was inserting that scene from Wolverine issue 87 here, because the situation is so similar, the dialogue has almost the exact same feeling to it. I even would have thought it was cool if he did reveal that this scene in Numidia was that scene from Wolverine 87. We were told very little about that situation, and given that Marvel will very likely never reference this one-shot again, that would explain why. But no, instead we're told that Team X went on two different missions and an extremely similar scene played out on both of them. That feels lazy and particularly uninspired to me. To the north, Team 7 has reached the outer perimeter of the Super Soldier Facility's defenses. 
or, as Cray would call it, the killing zone. Lynch needs that missile that Chang was bypassing, so come on, man, where are you at? Chang explains that the bypass is right next to the self-destruct function, so it's taking him a little more time than he thought it would. Cash tells his teammate not to hurry on his account. Zauber and Assad, still in pursuit, pull up into the SAM launcher's blind spot. Assad, armed with an assault rifle, opens fire and catches Lynch. It's hard to tell where, if it was his side or his arm or his leg, but his body starts to pitch out of the launcher. Cray and Dane immediately lay down suppression fire, forcing Assad back, and that gives Cash some time to grab Lynch before he falls from the vehicle. Chang finally finishes with the missile, and it streaks away, detonating just inside of the facility. Team 7 rolls in, and they start mowing down bad guys. Chang comments that their ride is gone, and their covert mission is no longer covert, so they might as well kill as many bad guys as they can. Cash asks about a possible extraction chopper that Craven, the head of I.O., promised them. Cray laughs. He wouldn't bet on that. Zauber and Assad, at his direction, stop at the airfield and hangar portion of the facility. Assad orders some of his men to prep a helicopter for takeoff. Duplessis contacts him over the radio, informing him of Team X's assault and asking about what he encountered. Assad reports a small squad as well, but he figures that a two-pronged attack by two small squads must mean that a larger force is coming. This base is large, it is armored, and it has super soldiers inside of it. No way could the American dogs expect two squads to totally destroy it. He hops into the chopper and means to circle the perimeter for any signs of a larger force. This works well for Zauber. She volunteers to secure the experimental subjects, secretly hoping that she can salvage her mission. Our narrative then moves to the sky, but we aren't following Assad. We first meet Craven and Gabriel, who appear to run Team 7. Craven was mentioned only a few seconds ago. He was the one who promised the team an evac chopper that Cray doesn't believe in. He tells Gabriel about his frustrations regarding Team 7's rather, shall we say, noticeable entrance? He wants the data from the Super Soldier program because he thinks that it might be instrumental in finishing his immortality project. Gabriel, however, trusts in Team 7's resourcefulness and ability. He is sure that they can pull this off. Craven disagrees. They need to prepare to sterilize the site just in case. This really surprises Gabriel. Craven would really nuke it? Isn't that, I don't know, kind of more noticeable and harder to explain than just an insertion team, both Gabriel and I ask. Craven is undeterred, though. First, they'll cancel the extraction helicopter. One of the radar men on the craft announces that they've got a bogey in the air. It is way beyond anything that Numidia could fly, though, and it seems to match the radar profile of a SR-71 Blackbird. We move to that Blackbird and find Extraction Specialist John Wraith on board. Hey, Wraith man! Glad to have you on this one. I know that he worked with Team X, but I still didn't expect to see him here. Wraith, who is examining pictures of the site, wasn't expecting to find another team on it. Quote, would two black bag agencies launch an attack on the same target? End quote. The pilot states that it is possible, and asks Wraith if he can contact the team to give them a heads-up about it. Wraith cannot, though. The steel-reinforced concrete facility is blocking the radio transmissions. They can't give Team X a heads-up at all. The pilot then adds that he has a bogey on radar, and Wraith realizes that it is the other team's support. Just how similar are these two teams, he wonders. Whatever the case may be, Wraith knows that Team X has been modified by the Weapon X program, and that this other team was not. So good luck to those guys. Having complete faith in how deadly Team X is, we now cut back to them as Creed comes back to consciousness. He is still naked, and screams in pain as his wounds heal, accusing Logan of making him suffer intentionally. A group of Russian support soldiers call Omega Red, having followed Team X. 
just as they're about to report their location, North pops out and guns them all down. He returns to Creed and Logan, cursing the amount of noise that Creed is making with his screams. They're going to have this whole base on them if he doesn't shut up. Another squad of soldiers approaches the area that T-Max is in, this time with a flamethrower. The man wielding the weapon smiles. He'll burn the whole sector down if he has to. Logan smells the gasoline and naphtha, guessing that they're about to be cooked. North chucks a grenade back the way that they came, killing most of the men. But not all of the men. A few survived, and they begin to prime the flamethrower once more. T-Mex keeps moving, but not for long. The tall-enough-to-stand-and-fight-in-ventilation shaft that they have been traveling in comes to a drop in another shaft, and it is a long drop to the bottom. North, still wearing his body armor, grabs Creed and rolls off of the platform, allowing his armor to take the impact for the still-naked Creed. Logan, however, mostly just falls as the flamethrower licks at his boots. He does survive the drop, but the gunfire from earlier broke a lot of the seals on his armor. He is hurt, and he can't walk. Logan tells the team to leave him behind, and this time it's Creed who says no. Splint that leg up, you wuss, and he'll drag Logan behind him. This, by the way, isn't Creed being a nice guy who was concerned for his teammate. When Logan saved him and Creed woke up, he was in a ton of pain and being dragged along the floor didn't help. He intends to return the favor now and is more than happy to cause Logan some pain. North is amazed to see Creed standing. Logan grunts in pain. Yeah, Creed runs on good old meanness and he heals quickly. Logan will too. He just needs time. As Team X picks themselves up, we move over to Omega Red, some soldiers, and Duplessis. The flamethrower team reports that they're pretty sure that they cooked their set of intruders, but Omega Red isn't satisfied with pretty sure. He demands a sit rep on the Northern Insurgent team, and Zauber suddenly appears. They are right behind her, and, according to her, they are the main threat that needs focus. They should gather their troops at Duplessis cuts her off. No, she argues, the southern incursion team is the most dangerous, and they might be dead anyway. They should confirm that the southern team has been killed before they do anything regarding the northern team. Zauber gives her the stink eye from behind her glasses. What, you want to split our forces, she asks? Maybe Duplessis has a hidden agenda here. Duplessis grabs Zauber by the collar. Maybe she has a hidden agenda, and they should just kill her. Ladies, ladies, ladies. We've all got ulterior motives here. Can't we all betray Numidia and Omega Red and just get along? The point is made moot, as Team 7 reaches this level of the facility, and they enter the room a fire in. Dane still has Lynch over one shoulder, but otherwise, Team 7 is hale and hearty. Cray reports that they haven't found any records or super soldiers yet. Chang suggests that they clear the facility first, and then they can start looking. Omega Red, however, doesn't plan to let them do that. He dives right into their midst, his own body impervious to their gunfire. Zauber aims her pistol, and Duplessis cracks her in the face with the butt of a rifle. Was Zauber planning to shoot Omega Red in the back? Or, and this is just me guessing, was she planning to attack this unknown insertion team? As Omega Red wraps Chang in his tendrils, Team 7 holds their fire. They can't risk hitting their teammate. Team X, being led by Creed, who at least now has pants and his helmet on but no shirt, has no such concerns for Chang's safety. They burst into the room and open fire on Omega Red, who laughs, glad to see his hated foes again. He drops Chang and turns to face Team X. Duplessis takes aim at them as well, but Zauber tackles her, sending them both down a set of stairs. With Chang freed and Omega Red distracted, Team 7 now opens fire on him. The combined attack between the two forces causes the upper floor to collapse, and it lands on Omega Red. This leaves Team X alone, with Team 7 for the first time. 
all of the men aim at each other. Somehow, and I'm not sure how this happened, this does not immediately turn into a misunderstanding fight. We have eight of the manliest, most violent, teeth-clenching, gun-firing, beer-drinking, ain't-afraid-to-die, testicles like the size of an orange-having guys in, like, all of comics. And they talk this out. Mad props to Larry Hama for that. The two teams realize that they all sound alike, so it is likely that they're on the same side. Cray tests the other team by asking who won the World Series in 1970, and, after correctly answering, Logan has a test of his own for them. Since baseball is only watched by sissies and babies, he wants to know who won the Stanley Cup between 56 and 60. And once Team 7 answers correctly, it was Montreal, by the way, they all agree to team up and burn this mother to the ground. How strangely reasonable. I love this scene. Colonel Assad returns to the facility in his helicopter, having confirmed that there are no other troops approaching them. He tries to contact Omega Red and Zauber. Interestingly to me, he doesn't try to reach Duplessis at all, but Central reports to him that they are too far underground to pick up his signal. The aircraft carrying Craven and Gabriel picks up on the movements of the SR-71 Blackbird above them, it is definitely circling the facility. This leads Craven to think that the operation is totally blown. They need to seriously consider the sterilization option. Gabriel, however, is still unwilling. They do, after all, have some men in the field who would like to be alive. Craven scoffs. They knew what they signed up for. Man, I don't know what Craven's overall deal is, but what an a-hole. Above the I.O. craft, Wraith's Blackbird now picks up Assad's helicopter on radar. That vehicle might be the very thing that they need in order to save their boys. Wraith begins to pull up the schematic for the base. Inside of that base, Team X-7 finally reaches their destination, the Super Soldier Processing Tanks. Dozens of glass tubes filled with green liquid line the room. Mechanical devices attach power cables to their tops. Inside are men undergoing the transformation. North comments that they don't look nearly as formidable as Omega Red, so maybe they aren't done yet. Logan and Creed, however, are on edge. These tanks look eerily familiar to them. Cash piggybacks on North's comment. This particular super soldier program might not be the Kremlin's top-of-the-line super soldier program. They probably licensed out the basic model in order to get a deal with Numidia, but they're keeping that premium content for themselves. It weirds him out, too. Quote, makes you wonder about the type of guy who would submit to being customized in a tank, huh? Creed responds that he has a pretty good idea about that type of man. North warns Creed about seeing anything more and sharing state secrets. Logan is just horrified at the amount. There is a whole army here. Cray sticks a package of C4 onto one of the tubes. Yeah, and they're going to blow up real nice. Before they can blow up, though, Omega Red steps into the room and clicks a remote. This batch of soldiers wasn't really done yet but they should be enough to kill these American pigs. The soldiers burst from their tanks, their skin blue-white with mechanical parts randomly incorporated into their bodies. Creed is not impressed by them. Quote, Would you enhance their ugliness? End quote. Cash says that they're in a tough spot. They are in the open, they are surrounded, and they are really outnumbered here. North agrees, suggesting that they find a place to retreat to and maybe defend? That sounds like a great idea to Cray, and Chang is already on it. He bypasses a blast door, and the team rushes inside, unsure of what they're running into. Chang seals the doors behind him, and they then survey the area. Towering above them is an ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, and they are directly below the rocket exhaust ports. Everyone seems impressed by it, but they're also a bit concerned. What is in that thing's warhead? 
Cray starts to climb a nearby ladder. There's only one way to find out, he says. Five stories below, and that seems like a lot of stories to have gone down in just the couple minutes that have passed, in my opinion. Zalber and Duplessis are still fighting each other. Zalber reveals that she did some research on Duplessis and discovered that she's only been working for her company for six months, which reeks of a cover ID to her. So who is Duplessis really working for? Is it IO? Duplessis' reply is to basically say the same about Zauber, revealing that her cover identity has been dead for years. She draws a thin dagger from her boot, swearing that Zauber will not leave here alive. Zauber isn't impressed by that, though. Duplessis is a loser, and she kicks her square in the face. Team X-7 finally reaches the top of the ICBM and opens the warhead. It isn't filled with nuclear armaments or chemical weapons, though. Oh, no. It is packed with super soldiers. Talk about flying economy, am I right? Outside of the blast doors, a team of men armed with a cutting torch are burning through the door. Omega Red, who stands nearby, reports to Assad that the incursion teams are cornered and will soon die. He orders Assad to bring the helicopter around to cover their potential escape. You know... Just in case. An alarm begins to blare, indicating that the warheads have been breached. Omega Red knows that he is running out of time, and he is definitely out of patience. So, he just tears the blast door open and charges inside, his soldiers following close behind him. Team X-7 opens fire, doing their best to stem the tide. Cash is contacted telepathically by Gabriel, who has found a quiet place on Io's craft to do this business. He warns Cash that Craven intends to nuke the whole facility. He will do so by transmitting a code to Io's inside operative, meaning Duplessis, who will then activate the nuke. They discuss Craven's failure to blow it up to begin with, as Craven thought that the information here would be critical to his project. Now that the team has been noticed, and so much crap has hit the fan, though, he intends to just destroy the whole flippin' fan. In the Blackbird, the pilot reports to Wraith that Assad's helicopter has shifted its path, moving towards the missile silo. But the pilot turns around when there is no response from Wraith. That's because Wraith is gone. We know that he teleported out using his mutant powers, but the pilot is just amazed that he's not there. Omega Red smiles as he sees Assad's helicopter near the silo. Dane prepares to open fire on it, but North tells him to stop. Wraith is in the pilot's seat, Assad lying dead next to him. The two grateful teams pile in, but Omega Red won't let them escape. He dives into the bird and stands up, finding a wall of guns aimed at him. While bullets don't harm him, they do force him back and he falls away onto the catwalk surrounding the ICBM. He shouts for his men to launch the missile, and he runs for the blast doors, ordering his men to shut them. Wraith begins to pull the bird away, but the ICBM is starting to take off. If they don't do something about this missile now, some poor city is about to be filled with some jerk-ass blue guys. Cash tells the team that it's time. They kneel in a circle and link their hands, concentrating. Blue energy crackles in the air between them. A beam of psionic energy erupts from the bottom of the helicopter, plunging down into the ICBM. The missile explodes, and Wraith pulls the helicopter away just in time to escape the blast. Whew. Cash spots a figure exiting the wreckage of the facility, and it's Muriel Duplessis. Recognizing her as their inside operative, he tells Wraith to pick her up too. They do, but Cash is also aware that she should have blown up the facility with them in it. So why didn't she? Duplessis didn't do it because she is dead. Her body quivers for a second, and then she reverts to Lenny Zauber, who then turns back into her blue-skinned, red-haired form as Mystique. She then rattles off the list of unusual powers that both teams have exhibited today, and suggests that they all keep their f no swearing f***ing mouths shut. Both teams agree to this as they streak over the desert. They don't see the rubble shift once more, as Omega Red forces himself to his feet. 
He doesn't rage at them. He doesn't speak. He just watches them leave with a cold fury. One of the things that I appreciate most about doing breakdowns is revealing the amount of work, passion, and thought that go into even a bad comic book. It's kind of hard to hate something when you've spent several days reading it, picking it apart, studying it, and then talking about it at length. And I will still do that with Team X slash Team 7, but first, I just gotta say to get it out of the way, this story was bland as hell. This feels like it could have happened anywhere in either universe, Wildstorm or Marvel. Nothing of note happens to the cast, no one undergoes any amount of personal growth, and there is no lasting impact from the book. Part of this is by necessity, simply because it is a crossover between comic companies. Due to the issues of rights, publication fees, and profit sharing, neither Marvel or Image, who was publishing Wildstorm at the time, would ever be likely to reprint this material. So it needs to be self-contained, standalone, and be kind of forgettable. I would argue that such a restriction would cause me to shoot for the moon. Like, Let's go f No swearing. Crazy, right? These two teams may never meet again, so let's make it a memorable meeting. Alas, this is not what author Larry Hama chose to do. I do think that he did an excellent job making this feel like a real Team X type of mission. There is political intrigue, the cast is all in character, and they go up against Omega Red one more time. Hell, Hama even made an effort to place this in their actual in-continuity timeline after that famous Berlin mission. This does mean that Omega Red should be ranting about needing slash wanting the carbonadium synthesizer, so that is a bit off. I honestly don't mind, though, because I like Omega Red here. This is, perhaps, the first time that Omega Red feels halfway smart, reacting to the insertion teams intelligently and directing troop movements throughout. Omega Red is normally portrayed as basically a tank with tendrils, barreling through every obstacle that's in his way, so it is nice to see him be a bit calmer and a little more in control. As mentioned before, Mystique's presence here totally threw me. She is a good choice for this type of mission due to her shape-shifting powers, and she does have an established history of working in the government under a cover identity. I have never heard of her working with Team X, but she does have the background to at least make it plausible. I think that Hama should have held off on revealing that Lenny Zauber was Mystique until the very end, though. The final two narration boxes on page one of this book state that Zauber is Mystique. This makes me trust her right off of the bat, as I know that Mystique is now here to help Team X infiltrate the facility. I want her to succeed. But this whole book is predicated on covert operations, so I should suspect everyone of being a double agent, except for our heroes. And then this is doubly true for Mystique, who is classically a villain in the Marvel Universe. Hiding Zauber's real identity until she was rescued as Duplessis at the end would have made that reveal much more shocking and an actual surprise. Not just that Mystique was Zauber the whole time, but that she was doing a good thing and helping Team X. Muriel Duplessis was an original character for this comic, and honestly, I, I kind of feel bad for her. Her costume looks more like a dominatrix's than an inside operative's. Zauber gets a nice suit and skirt combo. Duplessis gets leather and spikes. All we're missing is a whip. This does make her feel menacing and more like a villain, but... I don't really want to call Duplessis a villain. After all, she was working in a cover identity for IO, which I believe is government-operated? But now that I think about it, I don't actually know if IO is run by the government or not. Craven certainly feels more like a CEO than a military leader, so, I mean, they could be a private force, I guess. Plus, Duplessis was willing to kill both teams at Craven's orders, despite them being able to escape. So was Duplessis evil? I would say no, but she certainly wasn't a good guy either. Hama writes Team X well, which isn't surprising at all. Creed is smart-mouthed and hungry for violence. 
Sometimes that's a boon for his allies, while other times it puts them in danger. It is spot on, though, and the scene where he strips is so perfectly Creed. Remember back in Wolverine issue 87, when Hama had Logan tell Gambit that Creed would do whatever it took in order to accomplish a mission? Well, here you go. Look at that dedication. North is still the gadget guy. Given that this issue was published in 1996, it predates North's ongoing series as Maverick, and so we never get to see him use his power to absorb kinetic energy. It is possible that North didn't even actually have a power yet in the meta sense, as Hama never even references North having one. I almost wonder if Hama was intentionally not mentioning his powers, allowing that to fall to whoever would end up writing Maverick on a more permanent basis. But in any case, North has the map, the scanner, he provides cover fire for Creed and Logan, and he lobs grenades when necessary. Sure, everyone on Team X uses guns, but North is clearly the backpack guy. The worst thing about North in this is that his face mask is miscolored the entire issue. Rather than its classy yellow, it is blue, and it kills me every time that I see it. Somehow, the black and yellow uniforms of Team X do seem stealthy to me, but that color scheme makes the blue mask pop even more than normal. Logan, on the other hand, is the teammate to have. He saves Creed from the mines, he saves him when he's wounded, and he's ready to sacrifice himself when he is injured. You can totally see him eventually being on a team like the X-Men and fitting in perfectly. He's also the one who is the most emotionally affected when they discover the Super Soldier Lab. As the one who has the most regrets attached to the Weapon X project, I thought that this was a great little touch. It does, however, come with a complication. At two different points in this comic, Logan is referred to as having broken bones, and in one panel, we can see his left arm being tied in a makeshift sling, and in a later conversation, Cray suggests that he has a broken leg. If Logan has already gone through the Weapon X project, then his bones should be adamantium, and they should be unbreakable. So either this story is set before Logan had the adamantium implanted, which is entirely possible, or Larry Hama simply messed up the writing here. Unfortunately, I am in no way familiar enough with Team 7 to gauge how well Hama did in writing them. In my unfamiliarity, I do think that they're all pretty one note. Each member is tough, sarcastic, and the perfect macho man of a late 80s, early 90s action movie. Chang stands out the most to me since he is the tech guy, but having a skill does not a personality make. I do appreciate the bond between the members of the team, though. After Lynch is shot towards the beginning of the issue, someone is always carrying him or helping to hold him up, allowing him to fire as well. The trust between these men runs deep and true, and that's great. As I mentioned before, when the two groups enter the Super Soldier Lab, Cray asks North if Logan is walking on a broken leg and North says that he is. Cray is impressed by this, and this is another small thing that I really appreciate. This little show of respect is just so nice. Most tough guys stereotypically feel threatened by another tough guy, but Cray understands, sympathizes, and even respects Logan for pushing on through the pain. Hama is also super unhelpful when it comes to my understanding of Team 7's psionic blast at the end of the book, I know from my research that Team 7 was exposed to Gen Factor and that it will eventually give them superpowers. But I don't know if that has happened, or if it's going to happen, or if they have superpowers, or if this psionic blast is the only thing that they can do. The team exhibits no superpowers throughout the rest of this issue. And I mean, sure, they're tough, muscular dudes, but there's nothing going on to indicate that anything special is happening there. Rather than selling me on how awesome Team 7 is, I am more confused, and I'm actually more ready to walk away than I am in buying more. This book does have a small set of dossiers about the lead characters in the back, which you would think would help. There is a brief explanation of the concept of each team, as well as short biographies of the team members. This was invaluable during my write-up, as it did take me a minute to memorize the new-to-me Team 7 characters. But, 
I also think that there is a real missed opportunity here. The point of every crossover is to introduce a fan of one property to another property. I came into this as a reader of Team X. I should be leaving it as a potential reader of Team 7. The dossiers tell me the fates of Creed, North, and Logan, which would allow me to go to a comic store and request some issues about Wolverine. But the Team 7 characters end up scattering to the Four Winds and multiple Wildstorm books. But as a fresh young reader with no internet access in 1996, I wouldn't have known that. Sure, the dossier tells me that Cole Cash becomes Grifter, but they don't tell me that he joins the Wildcats, which is a book that I should be buying. Cray ends up becoming Deathblow and getting his own ongoing series, while Lynch leads the Teenage Gen 13, which features Chang's son, Grunge. So if I ended up liking these characters, I can follow them elsewhere, but I don't think that this book does a very good job of advertising that next step in my Wildstorm comics journey. Speaking of advertising, a really nice thing about this comic is that there are no ads. There is nothing but non-stop action, baby, and that's pretty cool. To be fair, Hama does orchestrate a cast of 15 moving parts, and I think that he does it pretty well. The story flows, it keeps moving and jumping at a really good pace. I do have some minor issues. Radio communications play a frequent role in this story, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Omega Red forcing open the blast doors should have either bent the metal or crushed their moving parts, but no, it closes again once the ICBM is launched. I'm also not sure how Wraith planned to get Team X out of the facility, as he is clearly there as support, but there ain't room in that Blackbird for a three-man squad. These are small concerns that don't really affect the overall narrative, but they are there, and they do stand out to me. Overall, though, this could be a really good movie, not that it ever will, and while the narrative certainly isn't unique, I do think that it's pretty well executed. This whole affair is drawn by Steve Epting, with inks by Klaus Janssen, and colors by Team Buse. Artistically, this book works. Epting has always been a fairly realistic artist, so his figures look great, he has a nice amount of details, and he uses lots of natural shadows to keep everything feeling real. Having seen Epting's artwork on books like his run with Ed Brubaker on Captain America, or their indie book Velvet, and oh my god, Velvet is so good, you guys. I tend to think of Epting as the espionage artist, and you can really see that here. The colors are realistic for the most part, and suitably muted, save for North's mask. There is one big lettering error on page 37. The entire page of word balloons is set one panel down. It's still readable and understandable, but it is just jarring AF. Team Comic Craft do a solid job throughout the rest of the issue, save for this one moment. It just feels like one final screw-up nail in the coffin that is Maverick's ongoing narrative. While I wouldn't say that Team X slash Team 7 is necessary reading in almost any way possible, it is a pretty fun adventure. As someone who was always hungry for more Team X, this did scratch that itch, even if it didn't add anything new to them. I also think that it is oddly fitting to end our coverage of Maverick with one more weird one-shot. After all, his journey started in other characters' books and single-issue appearances, so we might as well end on a book that will probably never be referenced again. Having now spent a good streak of time on some Marvel books, I figured that it's time to explore some non-Marvel stuff again. I don't think that I could handle more Deadly Class, though, so I ain't picking that up again. I would love to talk about one of Rick Remender's other books, but I only just finished putting together my collection of his Black Science comic and reading that, and so I'm really just not feeling it. So, much like my decision to pick Secret Six, because it is my favorite DC book, I figured that I would pick one of my favorite indie titles. Join me next week as I begin to explore the fantasy wilds of Cliffhanger Comics' Battle Chasers. 
Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>